This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hey, this is Enoch, and today we're going to talk with Greg Lavadera, architect. Greg practices just outside of Philadelphia, and today he's going to tell us how he's dominated the online space for selling modern, contemporary home plans online. He's a sole practitioner, and also he's going to tell us the lessons that we can learn from the Swedish home building industry. All right, Greg, well, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So Glad tell us a little bit about who you are, and tell us a little bit about your firm, so people that say they've never heard of you before can just get a quick understanding of who's Greg. Okay, I'm a, an architect practicing in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I'm in the New Jersey side of the Delaware River, about six miles out of the heart of Philadelphia. Um, I practice with my wife. We started the practice together. She's an interior designer, and you'll, if you visit our website, you'll see that we talk about um, um, the integration of, of architecture and interior design services. And uh, we did that for many years. Right now, my wife is, is running another business that we, um, that we own, and so she's not active in interior design right now, but maybe possible that she does it again at some point. Um, so uh, I have a, a, a small practice, sole proprietor. Uh, most of my work is in light commercial and residential, new homes, additions, renovations. Um, for the uh, commercial work tends to be either small commercial structures or um, commercial interiors. And for your architectural practice, do you find that most of your work is local there? You're, you're meeting with local business owners. Who's the clientele? That you serve locally um, more of my work is is local homeowners um, sometimes uh, builders I've worked with before will come to me and we'll do something together um, on the commercial side I've worked for a number of, of local businesses a shopping center owner um, a restaurant um, there's a nonprofit organization in nearby Camden, New Jersey that I've done work with for a number of years and very fond of their mission and try to, uh, you know, help them as, as best I can while, you know, um, not punishing myself. <laughs> yeah. In other words, still, still feeding your family. Sure, sure. But they, no. they're, they're doing great things in Camden City, which is, a, um, you know, a, a, a city with a, a lot of problems, and uh, they have a great mission, and I'm, I'm really thrilled when I can and assist them with that, Yeah. Yeah, and so you are a sole proprietor, and how long have you been doing your own thing? Wow, okay, we, we set out, um, what year was it? I guess it was 19... 93, my wife and I left our positions. I took a temporary job with an architect um, close to home while she started uh, the interior design practice. And uh, the following year, 1984, I joined her. So tell me, how many years is that, Enoch? I so you said 1983? <laughs> 83 and 84, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, there it's 2013, so that'd be 10, 20, 20 30 years. years. 30 years. 30 yeah, so the 80s, no, the 90s, and then the 2000s. 1993. 1993. 94. So I dated you. I added a 10 years to your life there. Yeah. <laughs> 20 <laughs> years is quite enough. Yeah, so it, it, that's interesting because at one, you know, one point, you, you go past this point when you're, you start your practice. It's like, oh, wow, I've been working for myself longer than I've worked for anybody else I've ever worked for. And then you turn around one day and you're like, oh, I've worked for myself longer than I've worked for any other person all put together <laughs> all this time has gone by and it's like um, you end up unemployable eventually <laughs> <laughs> only to yourself only to yourself employable right so what are some of the what are some of the challenges you've been doing this for 20 years um mm -hmm. how long did you work for other firms before you set out on your own well let's see i, I graduated from uh, architecture school in uh, 1983 so i basically worked for 10 or 11 years before we went out on our own. So, oh. um, yeah, I became licensed, uh, you know, within the minimum amount of time back then you could do it within three years. Um, there was no IDP, you sort of kept your records um, yourself and gathered them all together right before you uh, applied to take the um, licensing exam. So I got my license in 1987, continued to work for other offices, um, some great architects I worked for in Philadelphia. And, uh, I guess it was by, you know, 
late, you know, 1992 or so, my wife and I thought, oh, we ought to, you know, it's time for us to, to try this on our own. So, What was the primary factor that caused you to make that decision? I guess it was just a matter of, of wanting to pursue my own goals. Um, you know, you, 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 as you're working, you become more and more competent and, uh, you know, um, you, you learn the business more and more. And yet, you know, in organizations where you might be working, they, they want to take advantage of your strongest skills. So you might be, you know, working on one component of a project because you're good at it and you can get the work done quickly, which helps the firm be profitable, <clears throat> which is great, but yet, you know, might not always be as rewarding for you as you'd like because you like the other areas of practice and you, you want to engage in those as well. So I think that, you know, if you want to talk about broad ideas, that's what really motivated us is that I, I wanted to, you know, expand my activities into to other parts of practice that, that um, you know, serving a role in an office didn't fulfill. So have more well-rounded kind of get your hands in a lot of the different pieces Get your yeah. Get your hands in a lot of different pieces. Set the be be the one responsible to set the direction and and uh, you know. And during those the, early days, Greg, what was what was your one or two of your biggest challenges? <laughs> <laughs> when we first started out, I felt compelled to get dressed and put on a, a, a pressed shirt and a tie and go down to the room in our house we were using as an office. <laughs> <laughs> I love it <laughs> because I thought I have to. It's had to get had to put on the costume to feel that I was in that mode, and that 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 finally broke down. I I, I never sort of regressed to like you know working in your bunny slippers and bathrobe and you hear people that, uh, oh, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot more of that sort of working at home happening, um, you know, in the corporate world now. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. um, that, that whole question of how, you know, how you, uh, uh, manage your time when you, you're working away from, from the main office is, is a, a, you know, a big popular question, but I, I never like sort of fell all the way to that point. But now I, you see, I, I just dress more comfortably and, and I, I don't think I have any more of those clothes anymore that I used to wear. <laughs> so is that one of your biggest challenges? No, I wouldn't say that was it, the biggest <laughs> challenge really uh, was, you know, finding work, getting the, the practice rolling. I used to always use the metaphor. I'd say, in the early days, it was like you had to push the cart every day. You had to pursue leads. You had to uh, work on the relationships you had with people, let people know you were out there. And then as you get further along, you find that the cart is starting to roll and you have some yeah. momentum, you know, yeah. and people remember you and come back to you. And so, you know, you start to find that work comes to you. Yeah. Now, the the upside of that is then eventually you get to a, position where the cart is rolling and it's very very hard to change the direction it's rolling in <laughs> mm. and i sort of went through that at one point which led to me making um some some changes you know in the practice um and taking on some you know some other uh challenges which did in fact you know sort of change the direction and, and, well that's uh, interesting because a lot of times we talk about when we're starting our business we want to identify that target market so we can do the kind of work we want to do. Because ideally, all architects are doing what they love. And so it sounds like you were doing some kind of work, whatever it was, that you didn't want to do as much as other kind, and so you made a transition there? You, you might say that way. I mean, I think, you know, you you succeed at, at, you know, a certain kind of work. You're good at it. And um, the people that you're doing that work for may realize it and return to you and you start doing more of it. And, you know, so after a while you find like, hmm, wow, you're, you know, you're doing a lot of this kind of work, but now you're having trouble getting perhaps another kind of work. Yeah. So f for me, it was at a point where I'd say I was very facile with home additions, renovations. Um, I was getting a, tr you know, tremendous amount of, of those from small to significant um, and you know contractors would refer me uh, you know past clients would refer me to to friends and and that's how you know that um, that starts to roll but then at the same time I found like I was a you know approaching clients that were interested in a new house and I didn't have houses in my portfolio because that wasn't the, the kind of work I was getting and repeating so, um, you know, at, at one point I, I 
decide, well, I need, you know, I need to do something about that. I have to, you know, get houses into, you know, complete houses into um, my repertoire so that I can evidence to people that, yes, I do that. People would have, you know, sort of gross misconceptions that, you know, I remember a potential client saying to me once, like, oh, well, you're not a house architect. You don't design houses. I was like, whoa, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I've never heard, they didn't talk about that category of architects uh, being one or the other, you know, in architecture school. So, yeah. uh, but, but, you know, there's, there's uh, um, people have misconceptions or, uh, you know, they have their own understandings, which may or may not, uh, you know, be based in, in reality. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that was like, uh, um, you know, that was a product of that momentum. Yeah, the practice was, was um, you know, succeeding, um, but <clears throat> it gains momentum in a direction and actually becomes hard to turn, turn the wheels. So uh, yeah. that's something else to be, you know, to be wary of. Yeah. Now, what did, when you were, Basically, what advice would you give to someone who's starting out, someone who's starting out 20 years ago, if you were 20 years ago, and you know, <laughs> trying to get that ball rolling in the direction they want so they don't have to make a course correction later? What advice well, would you give to them? Yeah, I, I don't know if you can really anticipate that. I mean, if, if you can, great. Um, but I'm not coming from a place where that was you know, so easy to do that you could uh, you know, get the the card to roll exactly where you wanted it from day one. I mean, when you're starting out, you're you want to take on work, you want to generate cash flow. Um, you know, if if you're if you're aspiring to a larger office and you're going to have employees, you're going to have payroll demands, and so you know, you you may or may not be in a position where you have to take work that that you may not feel is ideal or desirable. Um, because you're you're going to have cash flow demands in your business, so I you know I, I don't know if I have good advice as, as how to you know to to battle that, but um, I think if you're I mean this is something that I learned through going through it, but I think if you're conscious of it and you're you're watching what kind of work you're doing and you know you're you're always aware of a need to diversify or to to put the practice into other situations. Um, then I think you can, you know, be more likely not to find yourself too far down one track or another. You bet. Now, I found that there are certain sources in those early days, there are certain sources that are easier to find clients and sources that are not as rich. In other words, um, some some mm -hmm. networking or marketing activities produce more results. Yeah. What's your comment on that? What In those early days, what did you find to be, I'm sure you probably found what those were and honed in on them. What were the... Well, I mean, friends and family, you know, brought early work. That's not uncommon. Neighbors and, you know, acquaintances, um, nurturing the relationships with the builders you work with. I mean, I've, I've, I, I, I really can't even remember an adversarial relationship that I had with a builder, you know, since I've had my own practice. That was not, you know, something that would be uncommon in, in you know, the practices I worked in before. I mean, they were doing public work. They were doing, you know, um, work that could be difficult and you would could certainly have a you know a um a conflict with a builder but i've um you know been tried to be really conscientious of uh you know their business and their business needs and and trying to work in a way that they can succeed and then um part of the fallout from that is that my client has a, a good project experience as well so so that was that was one of you know the places. The other place was with my wife Karen working on interior design. Um, she had very good relationships with sales reps for furniture and office systems. And uh, this is something that exists more, I think, in interior design than does in architecture. Um, but those sales representatives were a, a big part, I think, in spreading the word that we had a new practice and uh, um, some early clients came through contacts we made through them. Yeah, nice. so, yeah, so for, for people that are going to do interior design work, I, you know, we always tried to treat the sales reps well. I mean, when you're doing work with them later and, you know, managing a furniture purchase or something like that, you know, the last thing you want is to have, you know, treated a sales rep shabbily that came to call on you. So, um, 
you know, those are, those are important relationships as well. Okay. So what I'm hearing from you is that it sounds like that's what I would call strategic partners seek out people that basically have the relationships that you want to foster. So you mentioned builders, you mentioned mm -hmm. your wife, who's an interior designer yep. and that that was able to keep your project uh, load full. Yeah, that was, those are definitely avenues for, um, for bringing work in. I, I don't speak this strange business language that you use, but I, that sounds like the right thing. <laughs> sounds good. That's right. <laughs> basically just people who, uh, who deal with, your your clients you know yeah. and i guess that's one thing that when i talk to other architects we're wondering okay if i need to go out tomorrow say i lose my job today i need to go out tomorrow and find work who's the one person i talk to so how would you answer that question who would be the one person that if you lost your job and obviously that doesn't apply but if you did who would be the one person you would talk to well i mean if you if you weren't intending to get another job i mean i still yeah. i i would speak to other architects i knew uh, friends in the field. I mean, we also did um, quite a bit of work early on for other architects, um, either supplementing um, their staffing when they were low um, as subcontractors and um, at times doing interior design services for their projects. In, in that sense, it was important for us to be able to present ourselves, you know, to them and for them to be able to present us to their clients as an interior design firm and not a competing architecture firm. Yeah. So um, having those two faces to the business sometimes, you know, is very good because, then, you know, certainly you want to face your own clients as an architect, um, but at times when your client is another architect, you want to be able to face them as an interior designer, as a complementary profession rather than a competing profession. Okay. Now, one reason why I was really excited about this particular interview, Greg, to get you on was because you have, you definitely have an, I can just tell by reading your stuff, but you have an entrepreneurial sort of, it seems like you have this entrepreneurial spirit. And the reason <laughs> I say that is <laughs> because you, you look like you wear several hats. I go to your website and you have a couple different projects that you're involved in. Yes. Yeah, so if you go to my website, it's divided into four quadrants. One is for a local practice. Um, one is for a property management company that is established basically to manage my office space and office building. So, um, I mean, I could just have that and not make something out of it, but um, in my mind, it's better to put it for forward as an entity that, um, you know, it, it has potential to have interaction with um, developers and, uh, um, you know, other other business opportunities that wouldn't fall neatly into my practice. So, so I, I put that forward and, and try to use it as, a, um, as an opportunity for generating other business. Um, I also have a, one portion of my site that's dedicated to the, um, the uh, sort of odd venue of, of building houses out of shipping containers. Um, I don't want to <laughs> spend too much time on that now, but um, I've actually gone pr pretty in-depth into a, a proposed system for that. Unfortunately, right now, it just, it just remains as a, as a concept. I've done some design work um, for clients based on that, but none of them have gone through and, and uh, built something. And then the last quadrant is uh, my, ho my, my house plan catalog, which is uh, – where I sell house plans, very similar to the way you see uh, other vendors sell house plans on the internet, um, but mine are dedicated to well, number one being very architecturally designed, um, sort of a positioned as an alternative to custom design for people that um, wouldn't be in a position to hire an architect because it was too expensive, or at times there may just be a, a, a mental block about about that um, about taking that step. And then they're also very contemporary. Um, they're sort of positioned to serve that area of the market where the housing industry really doesn't offer uh, a great deal in the, in the way of modern design. Yeah, so I'd like to point out for those who are listening today, some people may know who you are, Greg, some might not, but Greg has... I would I would say he's he's acquired a little bit of fame on the internet. He's uh, <laughs> I'm internet people know who famous? he is. Yeah, you're internet <laughs> famous uh, because you do offer an interesting product, which is your modern online home plan designs. And so I I'm excited to talk about that. So we talked about the early days of your firm. You're doing sort of the traditional architectural practice of building locally. Tell us about the pivotal moment when you thought, hey, I'm going to start doing this on the Internet. I'm going to start offering online plans. 
Okay, well, this keys into the story that, that we were into uh, a little earlier about, you know, feeling this need to change the direction uh, that my, my practice was going in. So um, it sort of came about when I, I, I got a advertisement for this Dwell magazine in the mail. They must have, you know, scoured uh, the email lists or purchased an email list of architects all over the country. I got this postcard and I said, oh, that's, that looks interesting. Um, and I subscribed, not really thinking too hard about it. And it came and it was like, oh, this is like, what do they call them? Shelter magazines? Is the sort of the gener- so this was a shelter magazine aimed strictly at modern houses and I was like, wow, that's incredible. I said, I'm, I'm going to subscribe to this. I, I'll probably only get it for a year. <laughs> it's going to go. It's going to go down the tubes. I love the houses I saw in there, you know. And I'm my in my local practice. I'm you know, I I set out to you know to please the client to design something that's compatible with their house if they're interested in in something you know, modern or contemporary, I, you know, I'm thrilled about that. Um, I love modern design, you know, a lot of architects that uh, come out of uh, their training with that, um, you know, preference, but it's not very popular in the market, or, or so we believe. So I quickly realized with the this tremendous success of that magazine that there are actually lots of people out there that like modern design and and the opinions I'm being seeing expressed from them is is where do I find that kind of house I can't go out and buy that kind of house so I thought well you can just get house plans can't you and I so I started this this like it was like a four day long internet search where I I visited literally hundreds (laughs) hundreds of websites or well maybe tens of websites and looked at literally thousands of plans looking for modern house designs and there were some out there granted a lot of these plan vendors sell house plans in their catalog that have probably been in their catalog since 1955 um, <laughs> you know and you can tell when you look at them you can tell by the style of the the rendering that they present but you know they eventually age out you know the structure doesn't meet today's standards so they they actually you know slowly weed them out of the collection so i realized i mean here's the sort of the the most common denominator in in the united states we're sort of unique that we have this this industry for publishing house plans that people buy and then take to their to their builder that doesn't really exist anywhere else in the world um and we didn't really have any any modern design so at that point, I resolved that I was going to make modern house plans of designs that I liked and thought were modern, and I was going to, you know, make my own website. I I didn't like the way house plans were marketed. Um, you know, you never knew who the designer was; they were anonymous. I thought, you know, you should know who the author is. That should be part of of what you know the the buyer is interested in. Um, in just the same way you have brands of cars and the brands of cars have different reputations that the house designs should be similar but you would see you know these you'd have these bottomless pits of, of mediocre house designs and they were indistinguishable you don't know who designed them they don't tell you who designed them they don't tell you any story about what is nice about the design where the idea from the for the design came from um, they give you the floor plans and they give you one pretty drawing of the front of the house, you know, very shallow amount of information. Somebody looking at those floor plans really doesn't have any idea of what the inside of the house might look like. Um, you can't, unless you happen to be adept at reading a plan and envisioning a 3D space, you know, like an architect, <laughs> you really can't tell what you're buying. So, so here I set out, I had, you know, a mission that number one, you know, is going to make modern plans for people that couldn't find a house or couldn't find a house plan of a modern house. I wanted to offer them more information so that they could see what the house looked like on not just the front from the street, but all four sides, uh, if it had four sides, and see what the house looked like inside, you know, what it's like to stand in the house and, you know, look into the rooms. Um, so I wanted to do better than the house plan industry was doing, you know, give the consumer more information, give them the story about what the design was about and what it meant, and then try to serve this niche market that was being ignored. Okay. So, that, so I'm going to break so this down really quick here. So for, okay. for starters, you found a need. 
you found a very specific need. So you saw the need before you created something. It wasn't like you went out and said, you know what, the world needs modern house plans. I'm going to start offering them online. But you actually saw people asking the question. I did. One. I, w right. I was participating on uh, Dwell's online community, their message okay. board, and, and that's where I, I picked up firsthand that message. Okay. I think that's an important point for architects that want to get their hands in something else is being part of communities, um, talking to other people, being on social media. It might not have an obvious benefit at the beginning, but what it can do, I've seen, and it sounds like you're telling us too, it provided you to understand a need that wasn't being fulfilled. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, at times we can be hesitant about um, speaking out loud in public. Um, you know, I know a lot of architects that seemed really hesitant to, you know, post opinions online, you know, uh, about design or, or anything. And I suppose there is some risk to that. I mean, there's, there's always many different opinions out there and favoring one opinion can alienate another. But um, I haven't found there really to be any bad fallout from, you know, taking a position on something that is an interesting, you know, subject to have a dialogue about, you know, like design. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how hard was it? So you, you had the idea. You said, okay, I want to do these modern house plans. And then you're faced, to me, it seems like an enormous task. You're not a web designer. How do you get a website up? How do you start selling yeah. those? How do you do your payment processing? How hard was it to figure that kind of stuff out? Well, it, you know, it, it wasn't easy. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't impossible, but I, I'd say that the, you know, the the end result is that it was more important to go ahead and do it than it was to do it absolutely fantastically right at the start. <laughs> Does that make any yeah, sense? So, so I probably spent a year working on the first designs and getting um, the, the first set of construction documents prepared. Now, you know, like everybody else, I have a full-time job, so this was work I was doing in the evening when uh, you might otherwise be pursuing, you know, personal interests or... Um, luckily, I could do it and spend time with my family. I would do it on the laptop, you know, in the living room in the evening. Um, but, yeah, it took a lot of extra work to create that. and. You mentioned the website. Yes, I had very rudimentary, you know, skills with HTML. And what did you I create, custom? Did you custom hand code your website with HTML? Is that how you built it? I, I did the first one. I did. Okay. Um, and it was okay. <laughs> it worked, but it wasn't pr particularly professional looking. And um, it's been updated since then, and it looks much much better now. Although, still perhaps a lacks the edge that you would get from working with a professional uh, web designer. But, you know, my own web skills have come up. This, in the second version, I created uh, a template using a, um, um, a free web page builder that came on my computer. Um, and then in, instead of really coding the whole site in that template, uh, in, that, in that software, I created an, a page template that then I ended up manually coding. So, okay. Um, and what, what's that modern modern design house plan site so people can go check that out? Well, it would be lammydesign.com, which is my URL for all my sites, and yep. append it onto the end slash plans. Okay. And that will land you at the uh, homepage of my catalog. Yeah. yeah and so, and, and you have a number of how many houses are you up to now in your catalog? Ah, good question. Um, I mean, are we there, talking 10, 20, 50? Uh, it's between okay. 15 and 20, I think. I don't recall exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay. I should know that, shouldn't I? Yeah, there, there's some some houses, there's like several versions of a, a house that's very similar. For instance, one design, there's one that is a steel frame, there's one that's a wood frame. So, yeah. um, you know, so there's multiples of that, but those multiples, those r variations came much easily more easily than than creating a new plan from scratch well, one thing so. i see and i definitely have to say about your homes that i personally love the aesthetic of your buildings and i love the homes they oh, seem to have you. a lot of integrity in the materials a very contemporary modern design i know that it's not what every architect likes but i think that you do have some exceptional some exceptional design so i i Oh, thank you. I hope others That's get very kind of you out. coming from another architect. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we all look well, for, right? You know, with, within within the uh, the house designs, I mean, I have to say that I've I've deliberately 
tried to treat them as a brand. I mean, the same way that you would look at, you know, a Mercedes Benz has a distinctive grill and something that you recognize in all their models. You know, BMW, they all have the, the what do they call the kidney grills. So the house designs have share some some common elements that that you can pick out in, in house to house. Some of it is the pattern of the way window units are put together to make larger windows. Um, others are the details of an overhang or the way a front porch is added onto a house. And so those all elements sort of become design building blocks and you know a wide range of houses then are built up out of, out of those, those parts. But the, the houses are all of a family. When you look at one and look at another, you can say, oh yeah, I mean, you see how they hang together. Now, within that, I've gone past now, I've started to create different collections where I can sort of expand the, you know, the variety. Because, of course, I, you know, architect, I get bored with, with uh, you know, pursuing one kind of design theme. And so this is, this is the way that I'm branching out. So um, there's the, what I call the original collection, which were the house designs that I, I launched the site with. And I've expanded since then. And then I have... Uh, new collection which I call the X house collection um, there's a little story behind that which is on the website I won't, I won't, I won't give you that right now but um, again building a story around the designs is, is an important part of it because you want people to you know have something to connect to you know not just looking at the plan visually but have some understanding of what the intentions were um, so the X house co collection is is it just about responding more to what I see as um, some contemporary design trends that I see in houses, you know, when, I, when I'm perusing magazines and websites on design. So, so this was a, um, a collection that allowed me some latitude to break out of the design language of the first house plans. Yeah. And then I have another collection which is not really started yet, but is fleshed out in the site, which is I call the Blueprints Collection. And this is sort of feeds my own... Um, uh, uh, nostalgia about about mid-century modern houses from the 1950s. So this this is going to be a set of, of designs that are sort of retro and and appeal to people that um, like authentic um, mid-century modern houses more so than contemporary modern houses. Um, so I I'm I'm way behind my agenda in, in fleshing that out, but I, I actually can't wait to work on that because it's sort of like indulging in a, in a personal interest <laughs> by creating those. Yeah. So, well, and Greg, one thing I know, uh, my expertise is web marketing and basically how to, you know, internet tools and such. And I know that there's a lot of people out there that start something on the internet. They make a website, they'll put up some house plans and they're like, all right, this is the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> and then days roll by and months roll by and no one ever visits the website. So I know you know, just wow. like I know, that all the yeah. work is actually in the promotion and getting people to find you on the web. The promotion, but also, you know, a big part of it is simply getting the product up there. You know, when I launched, I had one plan offered. And, you know, the odds of finding somebody that is interested in that one plan become astronomically you know large against you until you have more designs up there so I probably had four or five designs complete before I sold my first set of plans and what was that moment like let's stop for a second tell me about that moment well the first set that sold didn't get built okay. and honestly of course it, a lot of that happens people buy plans and for whatever reason um, their plant their their project falls through, something in their life changes. So that that's not uncommon. It's also not uncommon to sell a set of house plans and they disappear into the ether and you never hear from the people again and you have no idea what happened. And you know, so th this is sort of a level of disconnect that architects are not accustomed to. And this is, you know, something that is is in the nature of the house plan business. And I I would say is actually a very healthy experience for architects because um, it helps you build a detachment and uh, the ability to be, uh, you know, objective about it. So, so, well, the, so the first one did not sell. That one sold probably pretty quickly after um, the site was launched. The first one that sold and, and went into construction was, um, I guess it was 2004, which is about three years after uh, the site launched. So, you have to be, you know, steadfast. I mean, you 
put the site up, you're putting a tremendous amount of time into putting product up there, you know, and it takes a while for people to find you. It, there's, there's a segment of customers that will be doubtful and would not buy unless they saw that a house had been built from this crazy person selling plans. <laughs> so once, once the houses started being built and I was, you know, showing uh, evidence of that on my blog and, and uh, cataloging, cat cataloging the photographs that customers were turning, then uh, it's like the dam breaks and, mm -hmm. and now you have a lot of customers and there's houses being built all over the country. So, yeah. And yeah. how do you find that people are finding you? Are they, let's say, Google, is it through forums, is it through outreach that you do? What is it that how do, is there one particular source that's greater typically, than others? Yeah, typically it will be somebody looking for house design and Googling for house plans. Now, um, they may have, you know, different tastes and aren't finding what they like on, you know, the mass marketed uh, house plan sites. Or they may use, you know, as a result of that, may use a search term that um, is... Uh, a little bit un more unusual. You know, for instance, you can go in and see the search terms that brings people to your house, to your site if you're using um, Google Analytics. So you start to get an idea of, of what kinds of uh, um, things people are thinking about that, that eventually bring them to your site. Uh, so you, know, you get people searching for modern house designs, modern house plans, contemporary house plans, um, cube house plans for some reason. That's a term that comes up very frequently. Interesting. Um, Can I stop yeah. this for a second? I find that interesting because I know what I find with um, what people search for a lot of times, because we're trained architects, the language we use is different than the right. layman. And so I could, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. If I yeah. was a layman, I wouldn't really might not even know the word modern architecture. Yep. I might People just use say terms I wanted a like cube house. box house, Lego house. Mm -hmm. You see terms like that. <clears throat> yeah. So I mean, of course, that led me to have a design on my site that's called the cube house. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> because, <laughs> because of course, it, and that was a perfect excuse to you know conceive of a very boxy house, and and uh, um, and of course that garners a certain amount of, of you know. Uh, web hits just because of the name and it, that may not be the the somebody might not really be looking for a house shaped like a cube but that i that term the cube house means something to them so well that is a very subtle marketing technique that i think those who are listening to this if they want to sell something online or want to be found online they should take note because what you're telling us if i can just rephrase is that there are certain maybe obscure terms that people might search for where there's not a lot of competition, if you can find out what those are and produce something that matches that term, then yeah. you can people will find you. Right. Or you you take you can take terms that you see repeating, and um, you can put them right into the meta um, data at the head of your website, and then you know again that will increase the number of hits that that you get. So. Now, don't get the impression that I'm some kind of web guru because I I know very little about this. <laughs> it's, it's only well, you know what, and I, it's funny. It's funny, Greg, because you and I started about the same time in the early '90s with the internet and making web pages. And back then, yes, it was all hand coding. You had to write the HTML tags. You put in the metadata. Um, right. Today, it's progressed so far that I can basically give someone or anyone could go get a website that right. ten years ago would have cost five thousand dollars. You can have one yeah. for thirty dollars. You know. And so that information is one thing that I provide on my website is showing people how they can set up a professional looking website that includes all of those things you talked about, Google Analytics, uh, social media right. profiles, um, testimonials, even the ability to sell stuff online. It's so easy now. Yeah, I, I have a little bit of a unique problem is I, I in if I upgrade to a, a sort of modern website platform. Um, I'm going to forgo a lot of standing links back to my site um, that are out on the internet. Now, a friend of mine who is a, a web programmer told me that there's something called a redirect table that essentially is a place where um, page calls that have no corresponding web page will land. It will look up where it should send you instead. So there is a way that you can sort of correct um, the change in URLs for a newly formatted website and retain all your past links. 
but that's just something I haven't figured out how to do yet. <laughs> well, hey, I'll tell you what, we can talk about this later, um, you and I, but yeah, it's called, it's called a, a redirect and you can set that up very, very simply. And what you're referring to is the juice. We call it the search juice or something, the, the traffic, because all those links provide juice to your website. So right. you don't want to just cut those off and, and throw them to the wind. That would be throwing out years and years of hard work. Right. You know. So that that's why that they sort of the the sort of um, mediocre structure I gave to the website early on is still there in the bones of my site because you want those URLs to still work. So Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, so I mean the modern house plans, you found success with that. People are building them. I've looked on your blog. You have amazing construction photos where people can see these different modern contemporary houses being built. Yeah. And so that's that's I mean that's cool. It is. You know? It's great. I mean, and that, this was work. sort of the 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 change in the direction of my practice that I was looking for when you know when I came to that conclusion that you know the cart was rolling out of control. Um, and I in in that regard it's been very successful. I can, you know, certainly represent to potential clients that I am a, now a house architect. I have, a, you know, a large body of houses not only built um you know, in, in my region, but all over the country, which has also been, you know, another interesting aspect of doing the house plans is that um, it's expanded my practice to being nationwide, at least at some level, because, um, yes, I will, um, you know, have sell house plans off to somebody, you know, on the other side of the country, but I will also have people that want to have the plans modified, um, some of them very significantly. And so that becomes a project that I'm doing, you know, in another part of the country. So um, also is a, you know, is a, was a great, a great fallout from, from doing the house plans and one I, I didn't actually anticipate when I set out to do it. Well, and one thing that's attractive about your model and most architects get this, is that you're selling a product, which is very different. You've ventured into a different market than what we're, we're service-oriented yeah. people. You're now right. offering a product. Has that worked out for you? I mean, is this something you would suggest other architects look into? Well, I, honestly, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting aspect of design, and just as you're, you're characterizing it. Designing a product is a completely different exercise than designing a custom house. Um, you know, there, there are people that, you know, believe, architects that believe that, you know, architecture has a site and that the house is a response to that site and that client and their programmatic needs, which is great. But um, that, that attitude has landed in architects in 3% of all the housing that's built in the United States. So <laughs> it's not, not necessarily the way housing is is really done in in the united states housing is like many other things is done as a product which means that you are as a designer you're making assumptions or presumptions about um, who the client is who the user is what their needs are so it's a much different and in many ways a a, a very interesting um, design problem that um, that you don't engage the same way when you're doing a custom design now, that doesn't take anything away from you know, doing a custom design, you know, getting inside your client's head and, and doing a good job at, at um, providing what they need, what they might not have even realized they need. But it's, um, you know, as, as treating, you know, houses as a product design is, a, is another discipline and another design problem that is also incredibly fascinating and something so that I've had, really enjoyed. Has it financially worked out for you? I mean, I'm going to give you an example. So... There's other architects out there that have products like Michael Graves did a product line with Target, right? Where he's using his design skills, and it doesn't need to be house plans. It could be, it could right. be anything that you're selling. You know, I know architects sell all sorts of stuff. What would you say about the product business? Is it is it worth the time and effort? Well, <laughs> I mean, selling products, uh, the you know, with Michael Graves, he's doing that. He's he's doing the design work. Somebody else is producing, and you know taking care of all of the headaches of manufacturing that that's you know that's different doing house plans is a, is a little bit closer to you know to your practice uh, when somebody comes to you and wants to modify the house plan well you know now you're right back in in the the practice of custom design so um I mean, how has it worked out has it been financially i say 
up until you know 2008, let's we just sort of you know box out the the recent um, uh, housing economy. <laughs> I said you know between between the time I started and and the time that that housing sort of ground to a halt that. Um, the work associated with the house plans had become about 50% of my practice, either just yeah. the selling of house plans, creating new products, uh, doing modifications and, and customization for customers, which um, was fantastic. Uh, it, it allowed me to sort of become a little bit more selective about the work I took in my local practice. So, you know, at the same time I had work that I was, you know, really interested in and enjoying coming in through the house plan side, I was also able to um, sort of, um, you know, have the latitude to, to be a little bit more directive with my local practice and the kind of work I was doing there. It was really the best of both worlds. Absolutely. Well, and I've noticed, too, that this has actually opened up. You're passionate also about the role of the architect in residential design. I mean, you mentioned the statistic that I think you said 3% of houses are designed by architects. The great right. majority of the housing stock in America is created by drafters and, um, and, and home builders. And obviously there's some issues that go along with that that all of us architects mm-hmm. sort of realize in terms of the and, housing and stock. Sadly, a lot of them are also designed by architects that make the houses look just like the ones that are being designed by draftsmen and builders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that's a cheap shot. I'm sorry. I apologize, you architects working in those positions. Um, yeah, they, they can send they can send us the hate mail to enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that sentiment is, is really common among architects is that, oh, you know, we could design so much better, you know, houses that look so much better. And um, the, built, the built environment would be so much nicer. And, and it's true, but, but this is where you get down to the question of, of, of doing housing as a product or, or as, as a uh, custom service. I mean, the housing industry runs on, on um, pre-existing designs, house plan designs. And, and you know, the biggest developers will have in-house staff and, and will be creating their own designs. But <clears throat> there's, there's no easy way to insert into the, the economy of that industry that we're going to start paying architects, you know, 10 or... 15% of construction costs to do a custom design. And, and it, so there's, there's not nearly enough architects in the world to, to provide that much design. So, so the reality of the housing industry is that there are going, there are going to be houses offered as product. The, the question to me is how can architects become more active in, in putting new design into that, um, into that, that design flow? Um, you know, as, as I said, I, I became focused on modern design and you know trying to serve that niche market. I think that there are many other niche markets out there that aren't being served. Um, you know, we have a long heritage of, of, of residential building in the United States, yet if you wanted to go out and buy a new house that looked like an authentic colonial house, you really wouldn't be able to find it. You you find these you know elaborate gabled uh, McMansions, but but nothing that sort of has the the uh, modesty and authenticity of of a genuine colonial or federal style house. So there's people out there, of course, that really love that kind of homes. Some of them would only buy an old authentic home, but there's many others that really like that kind of home but don't want the headaches of having a really old house either or they may be relocating somewhere and they have to buy a new house so there, there's other niches like that I mean you said to me earlier you described your own house as a, as a California bungalow there's there's thousands of fans of California bungalows there, there's even um, a magazine in the United States dedicated to bungalows an entire magazine that's been published for years and so the fact that you can't go out today and, and buy a new authentic bungalow seems like a, a g- gigantic failing of, of our housing industry to tap yeah. into these niche interests. Yeah. But architects can tap into them. So, and I would say going with that, you know, obviously we don't want anyone competing with Greg because he's number one in the modern house designs. But I think what you're, <laughs> what you're pointing out here is that there are probably a hundred other niches that other architects listening to could fit into. Absolutely. I mean, like you said, if there was, you could create a website based around a federal style or a colonial style that was more true, that had something that's not out there. So there you go, architects. There's millions of dollars waiting for the, the lucky architect who wants to throw together a website. 
Well, you know, here's the thing is that, you know, people will buy, buy those plans and build those houses. Some builders will see it as a great opportunity to exploit that niche. And w what will happen is then you start to have um, the people who are early adopters or who are fans of those houses or those house styles will be the early customers. But the, as they build houses and if you are doing your job and promoting it on the internet, more people are going to see that and they're going to say, well, why can't I get a house like that too? And why do I have to pick one of these goofy looking uh, gabled McMansions? And, and so, you know, more and more people will find they're able to do that. More and more people will see people doing that. And then, you know, basically that's how tastes change. That's and, how it works. Right. Now, Greg, also you have, you've been creative in the delivery of services, right? So you've, you've branched out and you're doing online plans. And then the same way, you've also been creative in thinking about how houses go together. Right. You well, have very strong opinions about um, more efficient ways of building. So let's jump into that topic. Okay. This is really interesting. Well, go, going back to before I, I had my practice, the uh, the arc, last architect I worked for was Susan Maxman Architects in Philadelphia. Um, and I don't know if, if the architects out there recall, but um, when uh, back in that time, she served as president of the American Institute of Architects. And during her stint as president, that was the first time the agenda of the American Institute of Architects was aimed at sustainable building. Um, that, that, you know, whole culture back then was just sort of starting, um, but there was nothing in place like there is today. There was no lead, there was um, no manufacturers marketing their materials and touting their environmental benefits. None of that existed. So we started practicing and doing projects based on that. We were researching materials, trying to make decisions about, you know, energy and ca carbon content. Is this material green? Is this one green? Um, so I was there at, at, you know, almost the, you know, the, the beginning of this entering into common practice, you know, here many years later, practicing on my own, watching, you know, w how, um, this had manifested itself and grown in the industry. And I, I really wasn't sure how to, you know, address it in my own practice. I certainly believed in it. Um, it was very rare for me to find a client that had concerns about it and, and was looking for that, you know, to be incorporated into their designs. But um, so then later on, I'm doing the house plans. I'm, I'm uh, part of doing the house plans was sh showing my customers as they built their houses trying to show other potential customers what it's like to build a house so it's not so foreign. And during that time, I got contacted by this fellow who was living in Sweden, was my friend Scott Hedges. And uh, he said, I've been you know, reading your website. He was a past Dwell magazine reader. And he said, um, you know, prefabrication is sort of a buzzword in the United States now. And everybody's trying this crazy stuff. Well, here in Sweden, everybody's building prefabricated houses and they're built much differently than we build there. And so we started looking at this. He was sending me photographs of pictures of houses and house construction that he was seeing in Sweden. And we were sort of unpacking it and trying to figure out how they were building their houses. Um, as you might expect, the energy performance of their houses is exemplary. Uh, if, if you took a house from Sweden and put it down in Germany where the passive house standard came from, uh, any Swedish house on the market would probably qualify as a passive house if, if you moved a little bit south into Germany. <laughs> <laughs> the houses are all very airtight, they're highly insulated, and they're all built what we call here, you know, architects call prefabricated. Um, more correctly, they're built off-site and rapidly assembled on the construction site. Sure. So, so they've actually taken, from reading your website, and you have an entire blog post about this, They've taken. I mean, they've thrown out the two by fours. They've thrown out the sill plates and the head plates. It's not a stick. It's not a stick built house. Oh no, right? it is. It is a stick okay. built house. Okay. Um, and fact, what makes it different from a stick built house in the U.S.? What well, special things make it better? Well, um, how is it better? It's first of all that the Swedes are using a um, a much deeper stud than we use. They they use. Uh, commonly a 200 millimeter stud, which is about seven and uh, seven eighths inches. So like bigger than a two by eight. 
in, in, by our standards. Um, they're using mineral wool insulation in, in that stud cavity, so um, it, that would probably be about R32 for, for 8 inches um, in mineral wool insulation. And then they're using multiple layers of construction on both sides of the wall that, number one, create thermal breaks so that the wall is more efficient, and number two, um, provide wiring chases so that wires don't have to penetrate the air the airtight barrier of the house, which facilitates them being able to easily make their houses very airtight. So, so the 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 air barriers on the ins the warm side, so it'd be on the inside of the house. Right now, it's a cold Maybe climate barrier. in in Sweden more akin to like the New England in the United States. So um, they don't even build their houses with air conditioning. You know, we even, we use air conditioning even in Maine, you know, um, it's just the way we are as Americans. But, um, <clears throat> but it's, it, as far as the, the um, building science profile of the wall, it's a cold climate wall. There's a, yeah. a vapor control layer towards the interior. Um, well, when I hear you say that, I'm thinking in my in my head. I'm just putting myself as a builder. I'm thinking dollar. I'm seeing dollar signs. You know, we're making these bigger studs. So, you are an evangelist for this kind of building. Do you yeah. think there's there's a, a long term benefit to building well, this way? How it, can we apply this to the states? If if we if we set out in the states, which we are starting to do, to build higher performance. In, into our houses so that we you know use less energy so we have greater comfort all all the reasons why we um, <clears throat> why we set out to you know increase the performance of the houses yeah I, I do believe that they they are building performance in a more efficient manner than we are um, we have we've we're, we're probably in a, in a period of wild experimentation here in the United States right now. I mean, pe some people are strict um, proponents of blown-in cellulose. You know, it's an interesting product. Um, others swear by s spray foam. Some people put layers of foam insulation on the outside of the house. We're, we're all over the place. Now, in comparison, you know, we look at how we've traditionally built. You know, every builder understands a you know Western platform framed house. Um, they all build it roughly the same way. They know you know what goes in the outside, what goes in the inside. Then we look at our high performance building community, and we're we're all over the map trying different things. So, I look to Sweden. We were building houses very similarly, you know, up to the mid 1970s when there was a you know oil crisis. Are are you? Old enough to remember gasoline lines that <laughs> very very yeah I was pretty young. <laughs> well, so Barely. that passed, and you know what happened? We we were concerned about solar energy for a while, and Jimmy Carter put solar panels in the White House, and um, Ronald Reagan took them off. Yeah. <laughs> so meanwhile, in Sweden, you know they they set up a a, a series of um, you know incentives and. Uh, um, s slowly over 10 years completely reinvented the way that they were building houses um, and that was that was analyzed by a, a study um, conducted by a group of, of American scientists in the 1980s and th they pointed this out like wow look at these guys they're using much less energy in their houses than we are okay and now another 20 years have gone by and they've gotten even better at it you know things that they were experimenting in the 1980s are like down pat now so yeah. We look at them, there's, you know, 30 to 40 years of experience of building high-performance houses. It's just w sitting there waiting for us to, you know, tap into that. You know, they're not, you know, playing around with, uh, you know, all these different different types of techniques, you know, sandwich panels, sprayed insulation, you know. They've, they've gone very linearly from what we used to do, and, and their houses are still built very similar to ours. Um, They've increased the depth of the studs. They've added layers to create. We're calling a you know a Nordic layered wall system, yeah. and um, so they they've brought up the, the performance significantly while still using all of the trades and practices that we traditionally used and you know are still using for the bulk of our housing. So you know okay. they're using mineral wool, but the insulation is bats. They're installed in a very similar manner to the way we install insulation here. 
Um, there's no need to retrain people. There's no need to engage with new and unknown subcontractors. These are all like uh, the kinds of objections that builders might throw at, I don't want to try that new. I have to hire a guy. I've never worked with him before. I don't I know he's not going to achieve me. I don't know how much time that's going to take me. I don't know how to put a price on that. You know, all of the all of the sort of traditional objections to trying something new start to go by the wayside. Now, yeah. granted, there's more layers, there's more labor, um, there's more material, that costs more. Yeah. In, in, in the end, though, what, what you need, though, is to be able to say that the, the amount of energy we're going to save out of adding this performance to the wall is going to, you know, be paid off through through less cost in a given number of years and and then after that additional cost is paid off the house is going to continue to perform better and to you know re return more money to the owner or or we should say not spend the, the owner's money in, in just maintaining it so sure well it's it's a long-term investment now absolutely. i know there there are there are builders there are developers that listen to this podcast so here's what it boils down to greg and this is from i'm asking you as an expert in this field okay do you think there's a market for the, if a builder out there, he wants to differentiate himself, he wants to do something different and make some money and do something noble, is there a market for this type of thing? Do you think it's feasible? <laughs> yeah, there's absolutely a market. I mean, more so now today than, than any time in our you know, recent history. Um, we, we see you know, the explosion of lead, how lead is used as a um, as marketing leverage to distinguish um, properties and projects to, to sell them. Um, there's there's many people that are interested in the environment and um, you know they go to the grocery store they'll pick the organic mustard just because it's there um, in a similar way if they were presented with an equal choice of buying you know a house that was better for the environment or a conventional house um, they would likely choose the house that was better for the environment you have to remember that in most situations people are not presented with that choice and so they they can't they can't choose an option that they might be uh, more warm to. Great. Well, I think if there's any budding entrepreneurs in the in the audience or any architects that want to go into building, I think we provided some really good information for a couple of markets they could go into and make a <laughs> killing because sure. it's all about differentiation. Sure. You know, offering yeah. something like that. Yeah. So you know, part part of the way, reason why the Swedes are are. Um, so successful with this is that they're building these walls indoors and the United States you know we have the carpenters there they frame the house and you send them away and then the next day the insulator comes and then when he's done they go away and you know the the drywall crew comes and the last thing you want to do is to have some reason to call that carpenter back or have to have the insulator make a second trip because that will whether there's um, twice the amount of work to do or not it's going to double your cost because they're coming out to your site and spending a day at your project again but when you build that same wall that has multiple layers and multiple layers of insulation in a factory laying on a table instead of standing up now suddenly the speed with which you can put the wall together is so much faster because you don't have to lift anything. You don't have to climb up a ladder to attach something and climb back down. <clears throat> if the wall has a layer of insulation and then a vapor barrier and then another layer of insulation, you don't have to call the, the, the insulation subcontractor to return to the site. The guy is there. He's working at the next table. So he just comes over when that work is ready to be done again. And so... <clears throat> they're putting much more value in the wall for much less effort. And so, you know, in Sweden, uh, you have some people buy big houses, some people buy small houses, but all of those houses hit that same level of performance. Okay. So, if someone wants to run with this, Greg, uh, would you be available to consult? Because I know you have a, knowledge, a lot of knowledge in this area. Well, I, I would love to find somebody, you know, interested in, you know, creating a, uh, a house factory, you know, around those, uh, around those technologies, yeah, and, and we certainly have the, the capability of, of helping them create that. But that's, you know, if it, it, this seems like an early stage in, in this market in the United States for me to find somebody that's ready to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a very, you know, far-looking uh, um, entrepreneur that was ready to do that. 
is it is it that different? Because I know that pre-manufactured home builders right now they usually contract with existing prefab builders, and since yeah. those existing warehouses know how to do it, is it going to be that different for them? Well, I don't think that it's um, I don't think that it's so, that it's so hard to do it here. I think that it's it's more that we have a different business model. Um, for instance, I mean, we have large builders; they buy property. They improve the properties so that houses can be built there. They build the houses, they market them, and they sell them. Right? But they're largely um, hiring local subcontractors to do that construction. So they're, they're gaining advantage from the scale of their operation, but not really from the scale of the way they build houses because uh, they, they, they take advantage of buying materials in large quantities in many cases, um, but but they're not really um, they're not really extending that advantage all the way through the entire house building process. Now, in uh, our country, we have offsite construction. It's more typically done as um, modular. I'm sure, your listeners are familiar. Modular: the pieces of the house come out um, on a trailer of a truck. The large dimension. Um, the house is put together by lining up all the, these pre-assembled modules. So. Um, the business model for that in the United States is predominantly small local builders buy the houses from the factory, they complete the on-site work, they prep the foundations when the house is placed, they complete the interior of the house and make it ready for the buyer and they sell it to the buyer. So very different than in Sweden. In Sweden, the factories are more like our large developers. They will buy land, develop land, they will sell the houses, they will <coughs> assemble the components, ship them there, and then the person on site, in that case, is a subcontractor, sort of the opposite of ours. They hire a subcontractor to put the house, to do that, that last, you know, nine yards and put the house together on site um, and finish it for the buyer. But the factory is the one that sells it to the buyer. So, Interesting. Yeah. You know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a different business model than ours. And... You know, our, our large builders sort of protect themselves from, from the market and, you know, most of the labor in, you know, developing and building houses that way is in your workforce. And because they're all subcontractors, they're protecting themselves from, you know, down, uh, you know, downside of the market, having to let people go, having to hire them back. When you, you know, are operating the factory, you have those people on, on your payroll. But... The fact is that you can build the same houses with many less people, and that sort of mitigates that um, that risk. Okay. Well, Greg, how do people go to find out more information about what we've covered today? Your firm, online That's modern house plans, and Swedish uh, building design. Okay. Um, well, from my, my website, lamydesign.com, you can explore the, the four That's quadrants. That's L-A. Could you spell it for us? Yeah, it's L-A-M-I design d e s i g n dot com so if uh, you want to look at projects i've done in my local practice you click on the uh, the upper right and uh, <clears throat> it's organized by house additions house renovations new houses commercial projects um, and i have some of my favorite projects uh, posted up there um, then if you're interested in the house plans and this talk about the uh, um, the swedish building well you can go into the house plan catalog. The link is there. Um, you can explore the houses, look at images of the, the designs. Um, there's a link on the home page there to Flickr where you can see a whole uh, bunch of photos that have been sent back by customers of building their houses. Um, if you're interested in, in the uh, technology on the Swedish uh, houses, you would go from my house plan catalog to the blog link that's there. And on the blog, there's a number of resources. There's um, uh, diagrams and explanation of, of Swedish wall construction that has been translated to American materials. So we call, I call that USA New Wall. That came out of actually a, a comment from a reader who called it a new, a new kind of wall for the USA, and I somehow ended up with that as the title. And then Swedish Platform Framing, which is... Um, shows how the Swedes have altered our conventional Western platform framing in order to get better performance. 
So there's a good deal of information about that. And if you want to sort of read the whole history of us unpacking um, what was different about construction there, there's a category in the blog called Letters from Sweden. And if you click on that, of course, the most recent posts are at the top, and you probably have to go back four or five pages to 2007 when that whole dialogue started. It's pretty deep into the blog. So there you have it. Great. Well, thanks, Greg. Any parting words for the architects about the business of architecture? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you didn't tell me I'd have to have a uh, parting words. Well, look, you know, it's, a, it's, it's been a tough couple of years for us architects, obviously, but, you know, it's a rewarding profession. And uh, I'd say that the profession would benefit from, from us looking to diversify the way we practice. And it's certainly, you know, the uh, construction industry and particularly the housing industry, there's uh, pretty broad opportunities to, to change the status quo. And uh, that's, that's what I've been interested in trying to do. All right. Thanks, Greg Lavadera, architect. Thanks, Thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Good talking to you. You too. Well, that's it for today. If you like this video, please share it by clicking one of the share buttons. And to get updates when I post a new article, video, or podcast, visit businessofarchitecture.com, sign up for our email list, and I'll send you my exclusive ebook, Social Media for Architects. Everybody knows that you just gotta do it.